Well, thank you. Well, thank you guys also for staying around. Uh, so I want to tell you about work that's done in my lab, in collaboration in my lab and Michael Ellowes' lab at Caltech. And I'm going to tell you about this technology we developed uh, to essentially sequence RNAs directly in cells, in situ, in tissues. And this will be very different from the, um, the physique methods we heard about earlier. So uh, the reason why we care about single cell analysis is I think this is the, really the bottleneck of uh, a lot of problems in biology. In the sense that you have complex tissues made up of heterogeneous population of cells. They're intermixed into each other. So for example, in the brain, you have lots of different types of neurons, and they're intermixed with glial cells, astrocytes. And in embryos, you have different cells that leads to different lineages. And in cancers, uh, in tumors, you have the tumors and the healthy tissues, and so on. So what we really need is the ability to interrogate individual cells and look at what the complex transcription program going on in individual cells in the context of the whole tissue that they're embedded in. And so the questions are, how do we define uh, the identities of the different cells and look at what are the interactions, the single interactions between the neighboring cells? So when I think about this kind of complex systems level analysis, I think about very two different orthogonal approaches. And one approach is the single cell microscopy approach, where you, you can you know, engineer either a genetic circuit, in this case it's a circuit, oscillatory circuit that Michael engineered 15 years ago, and started this field of synthetic biology. And you can use it to look at synthetic systems as well as natural systems. And this single cell uh, microscopy method also allows you to image single molecules in cells. So for example, here, each one of the dots is actually a single YFP molecule expressed in this bacteria cell. And if this movie was playing, you would actually see this movie live and the proteins being constantly produced in the cells. Okay, so on the other side, there is the genomics approach where you use next-gen sequencing and use that to sequence not only the DNA, but the RNA, the protein binding affinities on the, on the DNA and so on. And there's been a, a really, you know, uh, maturation of this method applied on single cells. And so we have single cell DNA seq, we have single cell RNA seq, and so on. And, and this is a really powerful method because you can look at many genes at the same time. You can look at the whole transcriptome at the same time. Whereas the previous microscopy method, you're know, limited to looking at a few things at a time, but very precisely. But the problem with the, uh, the sequencing approach is that you actually need to isolate out cells uh, from the tissues, and, and because the, the biases in the chemistry, it's very hard to um, do an unbiased uh, sequencing of the transcriptome, and typically you're restricted to looking at less than 20% of the total RNAs. So uh, when I started my lab a couple years ago, I thought, started thinking about this problem, and so how do we combine uh, the elegance and the efficiency of the microscopy approach with just the raw horsepower of the uh, next-gen sequencing approach, uh, and without making something that's <laughs> a monstrosity. Uh, so I'm hopefully I will convince you that we can do this by not scaling down sequencing, which has, has problems going to a very small scale, but rather scaling up a really high, very precise method called single molecule fish. So let me tell you a little bit about single molecule fish. It's a method that was invented by uh, Ralph Singer, Arjun Raj, and Sanjay Tiyaki about 10 years ago. And the method is, instead of using a very long piece of probes, as what people traditionally use for fish, uh, well, I should say fish stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization, what you do is you, you break up the long piece of probes into very short uh, probes, They're typically 20 mers, and you have them synthesized in IDT or whatever oligosynthesis company you use, and you put a dye molecule on each one of the probes. And then you put something like 20 to 40 of these probes, tile them along RNA that you're interested in. And the reason uh, why this works really well is because now if you have 30 dye molecules on one MRI molecule, you can detect it very easily. And that's what you see here. So you have a single cell, and each one of these dots correspond to one copy of the RNA molecule that you have targeted. And the reason why this works well is because um, it's very unlikely for 30 probes to bind non-specifically at a single spot, right? So you see this haze in the cell, and that's non-uniform staining of, uh, of these probes. But each one of these bright spots where 30 of things come together has to be a real target. Okay, so then you can just count the number of uh, dots in the cell to tell you what the trans copy number of that transcript is. And what we showed in, 
uh, this uh, image is that the single molecule me uh, fish method is highly accurate. And so we targeted a single transcript with three sets of probes, each one with labeled a different color. And you can see when we image this single cell here, uh, all the dots in the three channels co-localizes, or a very large majority of the dots co-localize. For example, if you look at this pattern here, it's recapitulated in all three channels. And that tells you there's very little false positives and also very little false negatives. Because if you see a lot of false negatives, you expect to see some of the dots only appear in one of the channels. But in fact, you see most of the dots appear in three channels. So if something can't be hybridized by probes, you can hybridize it very, very well. And we know that in fact, each one of these polymer oligonucleotides has about 50% chance of binding to the RNA. So if you put something like 20 of these guys on a transcript, then you're guaranteed to see it almost. And, uh, and then I get this question all the time, um, what about secondary structure of RNA? We find that it actually does not matter very much. What's limiting hybridization efficiency in most cases is protein binding on the RNA. So for example, you know, ribosomes, that's gonna prevent your probe from actually hybridizing to the RNA. Okay, so we find, you know, in general, um, any, any RNA that can be detected can be detected very efficiently with this method. Okay, so, so looking at this image, uh, this is looking at one transcript, one type of transcript, right? So if you want to look at very large number of transcripts with this method, there are two fundamental problems. First is a density problem. So each one of these spots is diffraction limited, so they occupy some optical space when you image the cell. So if you want to scale up this method to, let's say, looking at 100 different type of transcripts, then this image is going to get 100 times denser, and then it might become difficult to resolve the different spots. And that's actually fairly straightforward to, to resolve in principle. And that's by introducing super resolution microscopy. So if you do this back in the middle of calculation, a typical cell, let's say it's 10 microns cubed, and uh, optimistic uh, estimate of super resolution, resolution is 10 nanometers cubed, then effectively we have something like a billion pixels in a single cell, right? That's as much density as one, one of these Illumina high seq chips. So, and if you think about how many tr total transcripts there are per cell, Right, there's only about maybe 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 transcripts total. So we have more than enough room to resolve all the different transcripts directly in, in individual cells if you do super resolution microscopy. And so we did this proof of principle experiment a couple of years ago where we imaged uh, 30 genes at the same time in single E cells. And we can barcode these cells, uh, different transcripts, and using super resolution we can resolve them. So each one of these clusters is a one mRNA molecule. And what we did here to distinguish the different types of RNAs is we just used different mixture of colors. So RNA type one would be red green, RNA type two would be you know, green blue, you know, and so on. Um, and this leads us to the second problem, is that how do you actually increase the multiplex capacity of this method? And typically we have something like five uh, or six different floor force you can look at with fluorescence microscopy pretty easily. So just using these combinations of colors, it's very hard to scale beyond 30 different types of barcode you can impart on the RNA. And that's what we call spectral barcoding. So you, you design some of your probes with different color dyes so that when they, you dump them into the cells, uh, on type one uh, of RNAs, you have red-green, and on different type of RNA, you have a different barcode. So, uh, so th that's the limitation of the method. And, and then we tried out something called the spatial barcoding, which we won't go into, uh, which you have ordered barcodes on, uh, on the RNA, and you can resolve by super resolution. And the problem with that, the accuracy is not very good. So, so you have space, you have color, and there's a missing column here, and that should be time. Okay? So I'll tell you about this new method of barcoding that will give us much, much higher capacity. And the idea is very simple. You know, so we're working for fluorescence and hybridization, working with fixed cells, right? So the RNAs are fixed in the cell. And whenever we image it, the RNA is gonna be in the same place. So we can keep hybridizing to it. And so that's shown in this scheme. So, so let's say we wanna hybridize against 100 different types of RNAs. So I design a process for 100 different RNAs. And then on the first hybridization, I have five different colors. So I put 20 of them to be red, 20 of them to be green, 20 of them to be yellow, and so on, okay? So the 100 different types of transcripts are not distinguishable. They're only distinguishable in these large subsets. But then what I can do, I can strip off the probes from the RNA, 
and then I can rehybridize it and change the colors of these dots. Right? So uh, after the first image, I get a bunch of colored dots in the cell, uh, and I strip and rehybridize these dots, stay in the same place, but their colors change. So for example, these two blue dots are not distinguishable on the first time, on the first hybe. On the second hybridizations, uh, one of them switches to yellow, other one switches to red. Right? Now they become distinguishable. So we've had five colors. Um, on the first hive, there's five different barcodes. On the second hive, there's 25 barcodes. On the third hive, I have 125 different barcodes. Right? So, so the barcode number really scales exponentially as the floor force number to the nth power. So with 100 different, different types of transcripts can be resolved in just three simple steps of hybridization. Okay? And the way we actually do this is uh, the DNA fish probes are made of DNA oligonucleotides. And we can, after we hybridize an image, we can dump in those enzyme DNAs, which only chews up DNA, and that destroys the probes and leaves the RNA intact. So now we can hybridize again with the same probes, but now labeled with a different color. Okay, so that can cause this uh, particular transcript to switch from red to, to blue. And then for a different transcript, we can, because we have a different probe set, we can design that so that they switch in a different color. Right? So the, we can import different barcodes on the different transcripts. So let me show you that this actually works. And we demonstrated this about a year ago. Uh, so here we have three mouse embryonic stem cells, and we're fishing against a nanog transcript. And you can see there's a bimodal distribution. So some cells have lots of transcripts, some cells have very few transcripts. And on the first hive, you get a bunch of bright dots corresponding to these RAs. And after we dump in DNAs and just incubate it for half an hour, you can see most of the dots disappear almost completely. So these dots actually don't colloquialize with any dots. So this is just endogenous for autofluorescence. And then now, if you dump the probes back in for hype 2, you can see that all the dots come back. And if you actually flip through these two images on top of each other, you, you see that almost every dot comes back exactly the same place. So for example, if you look at this feature here, it's reticulate uh, here. They're just slightly out of focus on this image here. Okay. So this is showing you that one hybridization rehype works um, the samples. And we can do this over the course of a week uh, you know, with six different hybridizations. And we can see the dot intensities don't decrease. So we know the RNA is well preserved under each round of hybridization. And, and we, when we apply this to, to barcoding different transcripts, so here we barcoded 12 different transcripts in uh, e-cells. So here are individual E cells, those little balls. And if we zoom into, uh, and we did three hybridizations, so if we zoom into this region here, it's blown up, shown here, we can see between hybridization one and hybrid two, the yellow dots here switch to blue, and the green dots switch to red. And of course, elsewhere on the chip, so there are some yellow dots that switches to blue, there's some that switches to green, right? And and the third hybridization is just a repeat of the first hybridization using the same probes. It's just a sanity check and can show that the yellow dots goes to blue and comes back to yellow. So over the course of uh, the three steps, you can you know, basically read out those barcodes. And um, within a single region, within a single cell, you can just count the number of times a particular barcode occurs. And that tells you the copy number of the transcript in that cell. Okay. So, so this method temporal barcoding allows us to basically scale exponentially in our barcoding capacity. And we'll use five different colors um, available to us. Then six hybridizations is enough to almost cover the entire transcriptome. And, you know, and this is, of course, very different from just doing five genes at a time, right? Because if you do it that way, if you want to cover the whole transcriptome, it really takes a couple thousand rounds of hybridizations, which will take forever. But here are six, six rounds, and you're done. OK, so this might seem very familiar to you, right? And, and in some sense, it's very similar to next generation sequencing. Uh, in that case, what you're doing is you have DNA balls on this uh, flow, flow cells on the Lumina uh, chip. And, uh, and you're flowing in uh, dye labeled nucleotides, ATGCs, with different, four different colors. And each time a single dye incorporates, you image at, you get a bunch of color dots. And, uh, and then you switch the colors on the dots. And based on the color sequence, as you go through X number of cycles, you can read out the sequence off that particular DNA molecule on that ball in the cell. But what we're doing is, instead of doing that at nucleotide level resolution, we're doing it with fish probes, these 20 MERS and you know, stretches of 30 of them. 
And so you know the sequence of the RNAs. You can design the probes against them. You can design probes against, you know, a, a big, big set of them. And, uh, and going through different rounds of hybridization, you can construct this color sequence and use this color sequence to, to figure out, identify, uniquely identify individual transcripts. Okay. So in some sense, this is like sequencing RNA uh, in situ. And the, the advantage of this is that, you know, uh, I think half the uh, sequencing capacities in the world is being used for look at transcriptional profiling. There's no reason to sequence RNAs at nucleotide resolution every time, right? The information you know what the sequence of the RNA is. You don't need that to count the number of transcripts. So you, all you, here, all you need to do is design probe set for fish probe set and just keep using that. Uh, so you have a reduced representation of sequencing. And then this method is, I showed you earlier with the colocalization experiment, is very accurate in, in detecting RNAs directly in single cells. And then you can just think about, you know, the cells you put on cover slip uh, as, or tissue sections you put on cover slip as a sequencing platform, right? And you can do your rounds of uh, fish chemistry on it to figure out what the RNAs are. And, and, you know, Marshall mentioned earlier there's this uh, physique method and in-situ sequencing that's worked out by Matt Nielsen and George Church. And, um, and the major difference between our methods is that instead of, you know, converting RNA to cDNA and then padlock ligation and rolling circle amplification to generate the probes for next-gen sequencing chemistry, we're going from RNA to signal in one step. And so, uh, so these methods, if you look at them, it's usually about one less than 1% efficient in converting RNA to signal. So unless you have a couple hundred copies of the transcripts, it's very hard to detect something. Whereas the FISH method really allows you to detect as many uh, transcripts as there are in the cells. Um, so we have been applying this method to look at many uh, different types of samples. And one of our focuses is looking at brain slices. So here's the mouse uh, chrono uh, section. And uh, you can see that it's stitched together with a bunch of microscopy um, images. And so if we zoom in on the region, we can see individual cells, the nuclei is labeled by this tracer injected on this part of the brain and projected all the way across the other side. And we can count each one of these dots, which are individual molecules, in this brain slice. And we're working on this uh, 100 genes multiplexing directly in uh, the brain. Uh, and we hope to overlay this uh, expression profiling on top of the connectome and the LM Brain Atlas. And this will be done in collaboration with Hongwei Dong, who used to be at LM Brain Institute. And we have been also been uh, applying this method to look at clarity cleared brains. So here you can see a brain, mouse brain, that uh, hasn't been cleared. But after clearing, it's almost trans optically transparent. And we showed last year that uh, the single molecule fish method can gel very well with uh, clarity cleared brains. So you can see these punctas of RNAs, whereas an you know, unclear sample is very hard to see them. And I think the ultimate ambitious goal is to take one of these clarity cleared brain, which is the size of my pinky, mount it on a microscope, and do your three rounds of hybridization and basically get out a 100 gene profile within the entire um, clarified brains directly on the microscope. And so, and we're using this not just for neuroscience, but also for developmental biology. So this is a collaboration with Marianne Bronner at Caltech. And in that case, we're studying these neural crest cells. So these are cells that are neural tubes that, that folds up, and the neural crest migrates out to form many other cell types, including our facial features. And the question here is, do these cells pre-differentiate before they migrate out, or do they get signals as they migrate out? So we can interrogate using this method, you know, uh, between 20 to 100 different transcripts in these cells and look at what fate, whether they have committed to a particular cell type, or are they still uh, multipotent at this, uh, at this stage. Uh, and we've been also working with Alan Rothenberg uh, on T cell development, so to look at different cell types of uh, T cells, um, and what are the transcription programs along the different stages. We've also been using this method uh, in looking at uh, human disease uh, in particular is uh, type 1 diabetes with human pancreas. So we can label um, insulin producing beta cells. We can also label uh, alpha uh, glucagon producing cells. And we can go on to profile all these different other transcripts in the same section. And if we scale this up, we can figure out what are the different types of beta cells uh, in, the, in the pancreas and whether there are subsets of them that are uh, susceptible to uh, for type 1 disease progression. Okay, so, so I think ultimately, right, this is a method I think that will connect the large scale sequencing approach with the uh, single cell microscopy approach. 
and, and the, flow, the workflow will roughly be that you have a problem you're interested in. You do RNA-seq to find 100 genes that, that's really interesting. And you can take that 100 genes and do it really well, do a spatial, look at their spatial distribution in a complex tissue and figure out what that, uh, you know, what the combinatorics of um, which genes are expressed in which cell types. And then you can make movies uh, that um, give you dynamical information about uh, the events that happen in those cells. And really, uh, we, we've been trying many different types of uh, tissue samples. And I think this is, you know, basically old fixed cell samples are more or less the same, right? So uh, this, this is a method that really can generalize to many different cell types. And uh, since we have this code above code discussion tomorrow, I think, uh, I think you know, once we get the DNA code, the SIGFISH will give us the spatial combinatorial codes of which subsets of genes are on individual cell, cell types. Okay, so, uh, and this is the collaboration between my group and Michael Alois's lab, and I should point out that these two guys, Shio and Eric, are the two graduate students that worked out this method, sequential fish, and they also had a lot of help from Zach, Sahan, and James, and John from Michael's lab. And we have a wonderful group of collaborators at Caltech who are, um, and elsewhere, they're helping us with a different aspect of the biology. And of course, we want to thank the Allen uh, Foundation for funding our work, as well as the NIH and HHMI for um, providing support. So thank you for your uh, attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a selection problem, right? So you don't want to pick genes that are really, really highly expressed. So you don't want to look at beta actin, you don't want to look at ribosomal proteins. But if you pick uh, genes that are expressed on average 100 copies per cell, uh, you're totally fine. You don't need super resolution. Can you run into problems with that issue? So you can, no, no, I, I think that's, that's not a problem. You can do confocal microscopy. And actually, we've been doing a lot of light sheet microscopy. Uh, so you can basically optical exception that, uh, you know, a thick sample. So you mentioned some points ago that you can pack 15,000 trans genes. Uh, 15,000 genes. Right. What's the, uh, in practice, what's the bottleneck to right. reach that goal? Right. So one of the bottlenecks is the price of the probes. So the probes cost about $100 to $200 per, per gene. Uh, each probe is 10, 10 bucks, you need 20 of them to tie on a gene. So, uh, you know, 10,000 genes will cost you $2 million just to buy the probes. Um, but the advantage of doing it this way is that once you buy the probes, it lasts you forever. So, uh, you know, single cell sequencing costs you about $100 per cell, whereas fish probes, you know, is an initial investment, and, but then it's forever, it lasts forever. Um, so, I don't think, and, and then of course you run into the problem of density, and you do need to do super resolution. It's much harder to do super resolution microscopy than just do conventional microscopy. So, I don't actually think you need to do 10,000 genes. I think you can pick 100 genes very smartly and do it very well, right? And, uh, and there are problems where you need to look at a large number of things, and, and those are limited to, I would say, to splice isoforms and not actual uh, different types of transcripts. And we're at, we do have a project where we are trying to look at, like, tens of thousands of different splice isoforms at the same time. Um, but, um, but I think there's a lot of biological questions you can directly address by just looking at 50 to 100 things. <laughs>